Good morning. Hi, good morning. Maya, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. Uh, middle of the winter, I think probably we're both from where our geographic locations of the world, we probably both have a little bit of snow today. Um, a little bit? <laughs> yeah, we got, I don't know how many inches we got last night, but I mean, at least it's soft and pillowy and fun, but ain't nobody going to go out on the road in this. You know? <laughs> and so, well, you know, if you don't have all your supplies now, you're going to have to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, I'm glad you're safe and sound, not wandering the roads today. You're safe and sound and well, ready to talk to music too. today. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I want to introduce our future audience to you. Um, I'm truly excited for the opportunity to speak with Maya Sharp, singer-songwriter. Um, she's written songs. It's just the list of people that she's written for, unbelievable. Bonnie Raitt, Trisha Yearwood, uh, Cher, Paul Carrick, Art Garfunkel, Lisa Loeb. The names, the list just goes on. It's just such a amazing list of people that you've written for and plus you have your own you have your your new album coming out in may approximately may mm -hmm. uh you know called mercy rising which we'll talk about a little bit later today so so excited to talk to you today oh well thank you so much for having me and for listening and for knowing all of those things <laughs> yeah, know, absolutely it's just recorded just amazing and just amazing well and we'll get in we'll dig into that a little bit today but uh when people realize the the list that they, i'm sure a lot of ears is perked up right now said wait a second She's a lot of people here. What's going on here? So I'm sure a lot of people are, you know, if they don't already know about your, your career, they'll learn today if they don't already know. So, well, um, well, yeah, well, thank you for that. I absolutely. Um, I understand that your, your first instrument was the saxophone and that you initially went to school to college to be a saxophonist. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that brought you to realize that you wanted to chase the path of being a songwriter instead? Yeah, I was about half halfway through college, so I guess I was probably 19 or 20, and um, I was playing in all of these like, you know, jazz combos and small ensembles, and I was starting to play with people that were also playing around Los Angeles in these other bands, and so I, I would go see my friends play in these other bands, and I, and I would, um, at some point along the line, I realized, oh, this is the kind of music that is really in my heart. I mean, I love to play saxophone and I still do sometimes, but I was really drawn to that kind of Americana kind of adult alternative thing that I was hearing from my friends around, you know, around the town. And so I started writing, first I was writing instrumentals for saxophone. And again, it was like, okay, this is cool, but this isn't like really the fiber of me, you know, like, you know, I grew up listening to Jackson Brown, who I, oh. I see right over your left shoulder, you know, you yeah. know, Bonnie yeah. Raitt and Joni Mitchell and Ricky mm -hmm. Lee Jones and, you know, those guys, Paul Simon, like, why wasn't, why wasn't I writing like that? So, it, it, you know, it took a couple of years, but um, I realized that I wanted to see if I could try my hands at that, you know, style, see if I could incorporate the saxophone in it. But um, I really, I, I, in the first year, I fell so hard just, just for the songwriting part itself. And then that quickly became the first love of it all. Like, I've always, since the very beginning, I've always loved the writing process, even more than the getting on the stage thing, you know? I mean, right. I feel like I got, I feel like I, I figured out how to be the artist because I wanted to get you know, the songs that I had written out there. And I knew that maybe every now and then I'd get one that I wrote with another artist, but if I wanted all the songs that I wanted to be heard, heard, I was gonna have to be the artist too. So, so that was the path. I, th I think it's an odd path to come in as a player and then start writing and then realize that that's it. But, you know, hopefully it made those, at least the earlier albums, it made them a little unusual that, you know, the singer all of a sudden you know, has a saxophone solo in the middle of the song. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and you used that saxophone solo, even though you had switched. I mean, like you said, you still play it once in a while. Um, I know that as a teen, one of your goals was to play saxophone for Bonnie Raitt. And eventually you, you wrote a song that. for her and you did, you ended up oh playing her album, you know, playing with her. Dude, I can't believe that you know that. That was like my first, like the very first like childhood just like please universe i want this yeah. <laughs> you know? i want to play saxophone for bonnie Raitt. i was playing i was playing saxophone along to all of her albums um just i i saw her live countless times 
And then years later, she records three of my songs, which was already like, I can't even believe this is happening. Right, right. And then she asked me to come in and recreate some of the harmonies that I did on my versions of those songs that she heard. And then recreate a horn section on one of the songs that she heard. And so we were hanging in the studio for a couple days. And at the end of the second day, she asked me if I want to sit in with her on, um, on uh, a show that she was doing um, in town. And so I sat in on freaking Angel from Montgomery and already is like, what? This is just the total, totally surreal. I, I yeah. can't my mind and my soul around this. And the whole time, she's as cool as you think she is she's just totally down to earth i feel like she's been a friend forever just totally like no ego awesome and at the end of that sit-in she asked me if i wanted to open some shows for her and like let me check my calendar you know really <laughs> and then um she asked me to sit in on on sax on one of the encore songs and asked me to sit in on angel which again was like I think I, I think my first reaction when she asked me to sit in on, on that song was like, they don't want to hear me sing Angel. They want to hear you sing Angel. <laughs> like, I almost like fired myself. Like, why would I do that? I had this opportunity. So I did that. And then I got to play saxophone with her. And there was a moment where I looked over. I'm like, holy crap. Like, yeah, this is the route that it took, but I'll take it. Look at that. I can't imagine the feelings. Yeah, I can't imagine when you're up there playing saxophone after the years of, you know, thinking that, you know, no. playing, playing saxophone in your bedroom, in the front room at the house and going, boy, someday I would just love to play saxophone for Bonnie Raitt. And you did. And you did. And I did. Like, what? <laughs> if that's not inspiration for anybody, you know, to fulfill their dreams and to believe in themselves, then I don't know what is. I don't know what is if it's not. Well, also, it that experience and many, many others taught me that sometimes the thing that you want to be true is going to happen in a way that you never planned yeah. or sometimes the thing that you think you really want isn't really the dream and let this other thing unfold because this might be cooler you know right so i i learned to kind of let the reins go <laughs> like it's okay if things don't go exactly as planned and look what happened with that one you know it was a circuitous circuitous route but it it made it just somehow. amazing just amazing i know I actually went to music school to be a clarinetist. All right. And uh, and I uh, I switched gears. I, I I ended up graduating with an education degree. They they said you know basically be really really hard to be a performer, uh, oh. as, you know in a in an orchestra or in a jazz group whatever it is. And so I I switched gears. And uh, yeah, I'm very I I I got to do the best of both worlds. You got you still got to play saxophone. I got to conduct uh, musical theater, some shows that, you know, orchestra. So I still conduct a little bit. And oh, that's great. All the things in between have just really led up to, you know, like you said. It. So it's just that path. The path isn't always going to be what we expected. Yeah, I thought I'd be a, standing in front of a high school band today, and I'm not, you know. But that's okay. I'm very fulfilled. Yeah, and we have to kind of let ourselves off the hook, too. I mean, if you have a dream when you're 12, mm -hmm. maybe that's not your dream anymore when you're 30. <laughs> you know, that's true. And that's, that's, okay. so true. <laughs> that's so true. That's so true. Um. So I know you come from a musical family. I know that you know your your dad has written number one country singles, won a couple of Grammys here and there in his career, and yeah. so that had to be part of your path a little bit too. Maybe as you were you know evolving as a person. Well, uh, in many many ways. So music was always in the house when I showed uh, you know a serious. I think I was playing instruments kind of just always, and actually my very first instrument, I can't believe I'm about to confess this, was oboe. And I remember my dad and I uh, on the way <laughs> to my first day of the seventh grade and in Los Angeles, at that time, that was the first time that music was offered in the schools. So that was the first opportunity that I was gonna have to, you know, to play in any kind of an ensemble in school and to learn an instrument in school. So we're listening to, um, we're listening to the classical station on the way to my very first day uh -huh. and there's an oboe solo and my dad says you know what there's not a lot of oboe players in la i bet if you picked oboe you could work <laughs> i'm like 11. <laughs> and i'm like okay <laughs> so, <laughs> so i played oboe for uh, a couple of years i played like in the junior philharmonic and i did all that stuff 
And it definitely set me, I think it helped the switch over to saxophone because you oboe players out there, respect. It is, I mean, that is right. a beast. It is challenging and all consuming. Like you're making your reads. You're, so I remember looking over at the saxophone section and being like, wow, that looks like so much more fun than what I'm having. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but it was just, I mean, it, there's, they've just always encouraged it. They've always been, been there, but never like forced anything on me. Like if I wanted to learn something, he was totally there. He showed me around the studio. Uh, we co-wrote, you know, he was my, he was my very first co-writer, Randy Sharp. Um, right, right. He's, he's awesome. Um, very like very, very careful, you know, of the craft itself. It doesn't have to, you know, it isn't about, you know, finishing the song in an hour. It's about, you know, making sure that it's something that people might want to hear for years. And he's had a couple songs speaking of that, that have been recorded. I think his record is 20 years after it was written. Like you got to just you, you know let it you ferment gotta, let it ferment for a while right yes sometimes yeah he has this one song um i think the record is held by a song that he wrote called the connection and emmy lou harris recorded it and it had been like almost recorded a bunch of times through the years but she it turned out had it on the shelf and she always loved it she's kind of just waiting for the right time hmm. and the right time came about 20 years after it was written so I learned, you know, so many lessons from him and just straight up advice from him. And they couldn't exactly tell me to go get a real job, you know? So I was like, right. you know, this is happening. <laughs> I always think that's great. You know, when, when people do, it, it could, it could be a, a double-edged sword. So, you know, maybe someone's, uh, uh, they want their child to follow in their footsteps and they are pushing a little bit. But when it's something that is your passion already or that you are finding the passion on your own without, you know, right. prodding to, to realize that it is becoming a dream for you or something that you want to do. It's so nice to have a at home uh, consulting group. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think he also knew that that's not the career that you push somebody in. Like if they don't love it, if they're not obsessed with it, if they're not ready to do it anyway, even when the returns aren't there they need to go do something else. <laughs> you know, if you're in songwriting for the money, that's a bad plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm glad that he didn't push you too hard on the oboe. I'm, I'm really, I'm really grateful. No. I'm sure there's lots of other people who are grateful for that today, just because we have you as a songwriter instead well, of an oboist. And no, no disrespect to oboists because you and I both know, like you said, and so I'm glad I'm a single read player instead of a double read because those reads, ooh. Yeah. No, it's, it's for real. You have, to, I mean, I think it's the same thing. It requires like full obsession with yeah. that thing. And if you yeah. are, then amazing. But if not, you got to move on. <laughs> right. right. Um, who was the first major artist that you wrote for that really helped you to kind of break into and know that, you know, to believe in yourself and then also to just help you break into and have other people hear about you. Right. My very first cut was with Cher. Um, and it was the same year that I put out my first album. So from the very beginning, I kind of tried to lead a double life of writing for other artists and, you know, also making my, you know, you know, making the albums myself. Um, the first time I heard Cher, who is obviously a voice that, you know, you just know and you just oh, yeah. always have. And mm -hmm. you know it's Cher like in three words, right? Right. First time I heard Cher singing my song, I was just hooked. Like, okay, this is a drug and I need to, I need to get this somehow. Like, how can I get my songs out to people? And once I had a cut, you know, with her, I could walk into those offices and like, you know, hey, I have this cut, you know, do you want a slice of it if I can get a deal for this and da da da. And, um, the song had been pitched to another artist first and that artist had been represented by a manager who had a label and that led so he liked the voice on the demo didn't record it ended up being recorded by Cher, which was awesome and he but he liked the recording and so followed up with me and so it kind of all happened at the same time from that from that one song don't come around here tonight which was um in 1997 wow <laughs> But I, I knew that I wanted to do I wanted to do both. I wanted to find a way to do both. And then I realized 
not long into this that they serve each other opportunities would come as a writer because of what i did as an artist and artist opportunities would come because of what i did you know as a writer so it's like i i knew i had to keep them both up because they were helping each other out yeah i was i was thinking about that as i was kind of thinking about what i wanted to ask you about today and i thought you know okay so you put a cd out you're about to put another one out you put out several and in a sense it's almost a portfolio for someone else to pick it up and hear it there. I mean, they'll hear it other ways. You solicit your songs different ways, of course, but you know, when you've put out that formal recording all mixed down and all mastered and and people hear it, it gets, you know, physically, I know the, the day of the CD is kind of waning a little bit here, but uh, you know, at least hearing a stream or getting a, a copy of it on, you know, someone sends a link or something and they hear it that way because it's, so that's almost like a portfolio edition. Every time you put an album out as a songwriter, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There, I, I have many artist friends too that have had, had their songs recorded by um, other artists because they heard it on, you know, like on the radio or on their album or they just happened to, upon it, you know, streaming. So yeah, it's just another way to get it out there. So like you said, each one serves each other. I think. Absolutely. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. Um, knowing that you spent most of your life in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and that just recently, I think 2019, you just moved over to Nashville. Um, how has your recent move affected your life either from the soul or professionally at making that move that kind of helps you reinforce it was the right thing? Right. Well, um, sorry, we're about to get invaded by Louie. Oh, that's quite all right. <laughs> There's Louie. <laughs> Mosey on outside. Okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> Looking outdoors and saying, I'm not going out there today. He loves it. Oh, really? He, loves it. he, lo he like pounces in it and plays in it. I Okay. Um, yeah, I, I was drawn to Nashville. So I've been coming here probably four or five times a year for many, many years. Um, so I knew that I knew that it was a fit and I was, I was just drawn to, to the influences here to the kind of all of the genres that are, you know, that are happening here. I felt like I, I could write kind of truer to myself when I was here. Yeah. Los Angeles, um, although I love it and I love, love the people there, it's it really like there are times where I, you know, I definitely miss it, especially like when I can't pull my car out of the driveway because of the snow here um, or the humid summers, all, you know. But also there's just there's just some really, really wonderful humans there. But musically, like to make a living because you live in Los Angeles as a songwriter, it tended to lean more to the sync stuff, you know, film and TV. Mm -hmm. I have some friends that are doing very well in that. And that's awesome. It just never was like my authentic self. Right. And when I'm not right, when I'm not in that mode, I think it shows and people will hear it. So when I'm when I'm really writing what I'm feeling, I tend to be outside of Los Angeles. And I've, I just kind of finally realized that. So um, yeah, I moved at the beginning of 19. Took, you know, it takes a little bit to like find your place and get, you know, settled in. And then I was working, like just taking every job to kind of bridge the financial gap of the move. And then we round the corner on 2020. Mm -hmm. And I think you know the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, so I no, yes. Haven't really seen like what is what what are Nashville and me now, like when I'm living here, you know? Like it, it used to be when I would travel here to write, um, you know, I would take like a week of writing appointments and every single day I would be, you know, at somebody else's place. And now obviously that's not happening. So I'm doing some Zoom, Zoom writes. Um I still, I still write with, uh, I still do a little bit of traveling, but I'm not, I haven't really like, okay, who am I as a resident of Nashville? Like that hasn't really happened yet, but I know that it will. At it least definitely will. A light at the end of the tunnel now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you kind of answered this question for yourself, but maybe just from the visits of being down there, you know, for the five years, you kept going back and forth and, and whatnot. I always hear that um, a lot of the songwriters down there 
that it's a songwriter's town with the ambition to be a performer. You kind of said for yourself that, you know, I'm really happy writing songs. I realized that performing is a part of it. Yeah. But, that, but I do you find that just in the past and interacting with people over the five years and now um, that people, all these songwriters that many of them are really, you see them playing in all the clubs and playing places because they want the song to be theirs. I know for you, you said you kind of like the songwriting part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I like that that there are, you know, all all versions of that here. Mm -hmm. Cuz it's a really good match if I get with somebody who just really loves to perform. So I get to kind of be the anchor of the writing and they and they get to be the ham, you know. <laughs> right, right. Um but yeah, it it really like and there's like every point along the rainbow about that like there are definitely writers that are like only writing like are i mean sorry are only on the stage are forcing themselves that are just like introverted as hell but just making themselves go do it so they can get their songs heard yeah. all the way to people that are 50 50 and love to perform and love to write and then people that are leaning more to the performing it's like it's all it's all here so um, I feel like I'm slowly going more to the middle. Like I used to be like, okay, I'll go sing it. And now I really enjoy it. It, it has to help to get that feedback from the crowd and to, to hear that, you know, the, and afterwards and beyond the, the compliments and email and Facebook and here and there after the show. And just that kind of real time thing, like mm -hmm. this happened. It, it's not, it's not on a stream it's not in a hard drive it's like you know a transaction occurred here and not a financial one like right. we shared this to get yeah. a bunch of humans in a room it's like extra extra painful that we haven't you know been able to do that for a while i've done one or two since where like everybody's masked like i wear the mask all the way up there it's i'm you know i'm solo there's nobody else on the stage with me and it was just such a like i need this back <laughs> you know uh, and this whole experience might make me go more toward the performing because like i really i really do miss it just just for the camaraderie of it just like we're sharing this experience you know well and being down there in such a melting pot of people you might find yourself sitting in with a lot of people and, you know, in addition to your own show, it's just, you know, from night to night, hey, can you come out and play guitar in this track and you sing some harmony vocals for me? And that might be more of the thing that keeps you on that stage too. I love that. I love, I love to do that. I love to have people come up and sing with me. I love to go, you know, sit in. Three-part harmony live is not, it's hard to have much more fun than that. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to skip around for a second because you, I, I had something I wanted to ask you about. Um, I was curious to know if you had ever performed at the at the hard at the Bluebird Cafe, Legendary yeah. Bluebird Cafe, and so I searched around a little bit and saw a, a YouTube video of you performing with Art Garfunkel. Yes, that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, and I saw that, and I and I thought, oh my goodness! After getting through the elation of having him cover one of your songs, because he's covered one of your songs, he's sang one of your songs on his album. Mm -hmm. um, what was going through your mind as you're sitting there looking over, and there's Art Garfunkel, and I mean, just the processing of you know. First, he sang one of your songs, and then you guys are performing together. On this well, we uh, that was a whole experience. We made a whole uh, trio album together. Buddy Monlock and Art and me wrote for an album. Wow. Recorded it, um, some in New York, some in L.A., but mostly here in Nashville. And then we went on tour for it. So, um, yeah, I had like I had the the kind of whole experience with him. And then, yeah, getting to perform with him. There were definitely moments, particularly in the studio, because there was one, first of all, just a side note, he loves the studio to be really, really cold, like mm. see your breath, kind of cold, <laughs> like 40 degrees or something. Wow, like, wow. Why? I'd like yeah. to keep us all alert or whatever. It worked. Uh. Um, but there was a time where we, we decided that for this particular song, um, it would serve the performance if we recorded unison at the same time, like maybe three feet away. And I remember just like, like it was yesterday being in that room and looking over and I'm watching his mouth because I want our unison to be, you know, as tight as it can be. Yeah. And it's freaking Art Garfunkel. <laughs> and 
where and his range like i have a lower female range and he has everything range he can go up higher than me and we were and so i'm watching him and it and somewhere about halfway through you know the take i wasn't like working anymore just trying to match his his mouth i was like that's fucking hard <laughs> and we're singing together and we're singing and i'm unison with so we're like blending as one voice like it was it was one of those moments again just like how did i get here but i'm not complaining you know absolutely so it's just so neat because to to take your song range to that level that the people that you grew up listening to and appreciating that they're now sitting in with you in a, in a session and, and performing and writing or you know you're writing for them or you're performing with them and recording with them sometimes just amazing to think about that yeah it is it is <laughs> i mean it, yeah it is for me too and and to you know like i i wish i had more control over those opportunities but i just like head down work and then every now and then something like that you know shows itself but yeah, that was a really amazing experience. Well, and and it has to be exciting to open your email or pick up the phone because you never know what's going to be on the other side. You never know as a songwriter who's going to be asking for your song. It's got to yeah. be so exciting. You never know. Open email. What's, who's what's here today? <laughs> oh, it's a voicemail. Who is it? You know, it's it's got to be kind of exciting and, and inspiring to know that, yeah. you know, what's going to happen from day to day. And it could be a song that was written 15 years ago. <laughs> like you said, like, yeah, you said your dad's song, 10, 20 years yeah. in the making, right? Yeah. So you never know. And it's so all of all of your songs from the past, you never know when one is going to. And this is this actually brings up another kind of question, I guess. Um, so uh, I know that you have also written with Carol King because I had seen um, in your, you know, the, the different quotes that people have made, uh, you know, at the time of your debut record, Hardly Glamour, I believe it's called, correct? Um, yeah. uh, she said this is based on that CD. She said, you know, Maya's CD is absolutely wonderful. I'm so glad I got to write with her. She's an old soul and a new friend. I mean, how did that come about to sit down with Carol King? Okay. Um, the owner of my first label, Miles Copeland, who managed uh, the police and the Go-Go's. Right, IRS right? Records, right? Right, so right after IRS kind of folded into a new label i was signed to that and um he also so he he had some pretty wacky ideas but you know and some of them were just like not you know realistic but some of them were like brilliantly wacky so he um hosted a songwriting retreat in the south of france at uh, a castle that he owned <laughs> from like the 1600s or something and he um he got 24 songwriters to go to the castle and write together in groups of threes every day and it would be like some you know some uh like well-known writers some you know some are new uh artists and he he would get them all together and we would meet there and then every day we would have a new session now because he published me and i think i was i think i was 26 or something i mean i'm like i'm you know a total rookie at this point he's putting me in these rooms because he has a piece of my publishing he's putting me in these incredible right. writing rooms so I, like on day two of my first of my first one and I'm totally jet lagged and I'm nervous as hell like another level of nervous like am I gonna faint I'm so nervous I'm in the room with Carol King <laughs> oh man Gary Burr who is an awesome writer here Gary Burr and uh Carol and me in the room and he would have intimidated me except that she's in the room so him and I are like, okay, buddy, we got this. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, we just met too. Right. So, uh, yeah. And she was, I've been so fortunate. She was just totally cool, all about the work, literally jeans and a t-shirt, 
okay, guys, what are we going to do? Everybody put their ideas on the table. She never played the Carol card. Like, um, excuse me, I've sold a billion records and you haven't. Like she could have. And she could have, right. Yeah, but she could have, right. But she didn't. She was amazing. She's just like, oh yeah, I love that idea. She said to me, I, I can't, I still can't even believe that this happened. As we walked out, she put her arm around me and she says, I, I learned so much from you. Wow. And I was like, you did not. <laughs> I learned from you, but you're amazing for saying that. <laughs> oh my God. She's just so like cool and earthy and seriously still. And I think this is part of the recipe of her success. She loves the work. She's just obsessed with songwriting. It's not yeah. about the fame, the money. She started as a writer first also. Like this is where her her heart is. And it really shows. And it it clearly hasn't changed over the years, even with all of her success. Yeah, I'll see some of her, you know, she does a lot of posting and, and live stream type things where she'll be in a library, she'll have her books behind her and she'll just talk about her songs and, and, and talk, and she just seems like, you know, take a cup of coffee out and let's talk, you know? She's yeah. really, and that's what you're describing. She's just so down to earth and not pretentious. She could be if she wanted to be, but she's not at all, I could just tell. And yeah. how many people can you say have a, a musical written about them? You know, the, the musical Beautiful, <laughs> you know? I, I mean. Know. It's just the career that she's had in reading about her, her autobiography, Natural Woman, reading, you know, reading about her and you just feel like you're sitting down with her. I almost feel like I want to get the audio book and I don't know if she, I don't know if she recorded her voice in the audio book. I got to find out, but to just, yeah. I'd like to hear her tell her stories like that, you know? Yeah. So really. Yeah. Also, who else like had a record, you know, on the billboard charts for what was it? Like a hundred weeks or something. Yeah, Tapestry like, was on there forever. Yeah. And I yeah. think this is the 50th anniversary of Tapestry. I think this is the 50th oh, year. I think wow. I'm pretty sure because I was just looking at things a little bit this week as I was, you know, researching to talk to you. But so there was a song called "Leaving Home" that you kind of, yes. and that was with Jules Shear and with Carol. Yes. yes. So I had the opportunity to write with her a few times. Um, so we wrote that first time, and then, yeah, and then and then Jules Shear and Carol and I. I think we got together just like because we had extra time one one evening, like. It wasn't even the like assigned right, you know, for the day. We just wanted to do it. Right. And then we wrote, we also wrote um, a song with a great Latin artist named Soraya, who unfortunately is no longer with us. She, um, she had breast cancer very early, like in her thirties oh. and she fought it hard and she was, God, she was just, she was so cool, so strong, so funny. And she, she recorded this song that, that the three of us wrote. And all of these sessions were on various trips to France in a castle that was haunted as hell, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what, what great experiences to think about, to look back and say, oh yeah, I sat down with Carol King and, you know, or, or you know, share a recording, you know, every day. I mean, you could have pinch me moments every morning when you wake up. You could have a pinch me moment every time when you just, walk through the house and maybe look at a, a poster that reminds you of something or a picture or it just has to be amazing so yeah it is i mean there are you know there are definitely lulls in it sure, <laughs> where you're like, sure. okay, um <laughs> right but that's where that just the passion for the work itself just has has to be steady because yeah. it's not always going to come back around it's not always going to be that awesome experience or you know you just have to love it if you're the only one who hears this song that has to be okay right right does it ever happen where you write a song for someone's voice in specific unsolicited like you're just thinking this is this is so and so i know this is their voice and then you get the chance to pitch it for them and they and they go with it they're like yeah and like someone that you kind of like put out there and say yeah i i hear their voice you know i that's one thing I have never really dialed in. Every time I think I, I am writing for a, a specific thing, it never lands there. <laughs> but when I write something that's just like really true to me and it feels very real to me, it feels real to somebody else. And that unexpected thing, like the chick song home, right? right. When, when my publisher, Scott Sherrod pitched that to, to their, to their, old producer who pitched it to their their producer on that album who pitched it to the chicks but that he even pitched it i was like really that one um oh i mean okay and they loved it it's like okay i'm just gonna like i'm not advising on that anymore like my my idea of where it should be 
from that seed point, I don't really know. So all I can do is put it out there and right. hopefully somebody else will figure it out. And, you know, whether it's just like writing it, you know, with the artist or just getting it out into the world and just letting people hear it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you typically end up meeting the people that you recorded for in the business or do they mostly pick it up through the various means of promotion and then you kind of get your compensation through that source as opposed to like having a conversation with them about the song or, you know, like in the case of Bonnie Raitt, you actually recorded with her at some point and, you know, we're, yeah. does that happen a lot or is it mostly that through the channels, uh, people that you've recorded for, I mean, you've written, you know, songs and they've heard, kind of get it through the channels that you promote your songs through? Early on, it was more through the channels and I didn't always meet them. Like I didn't, I didn't meet Cher. Um, I had a cut with a great artist named, uh, uh, um, oh my God, Amanda Marshall. Yes. She was awesome. I saw her many, many years ago. She opened, I can't remember who she opened for, but I mean, it was years ago. It was about 25, 30 years. She opened for somebody here in Chicago and I can't think of who, but I got to see her in a small setting just when she was starting out. Mm -hmm. So soulful. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't have a chance to work with her. That, uh, that song reached her through my co-writer, Randy Cantor. But all the other ones I'm thinking about, um, I did eventually meet them. Like I, I either met them because we recorded together, you know, maybe I opened some shows for them or I just like ended up meeting them later. Like they asked me if I wanted to come see a show and then I would meet them. Um, or I, most often, particularly like the last 10 years, I get the cut because I write with the artist. Okay. So yeah, like I think all but two of the cuts, I did either meet them first or end up meeting them after. Um, and again, I've been very fortunate because they're all just really good humans. I mean, it would be such a drag to like have a cut with one of your heroes and then they're an ass, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, they always say, don't meet your, they always say something like, don't meet your heroes, you know, because it could backfire on you. But, and I think I've, I'd say the same thing too. Um, I used to work for a record label and I met many people that way. Um, and, you know, for the most part, I used to work at music theaters. I still do work at music theaters and, and I've worked in all sorts of various aspects. So I've, I'm not a starstruck person at all. I don't consider myself. I just really admire what they've done. So that makes me giddy when I'm with them because it just, I admire that I can see yeah. them and then go home and put one of their records on. It always, or see them on a couch at a, of a talk show a couple right. of years later and just say, it's really just need to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And I've been lucky too that, you know, my heroes have not turned out to be someone I didn't expect them to be. They've been, okay, they've good. all been very, very nice, you know, yeah, good, overall, I, overall, there's gotta be one in there somewhere, but I can't, I'm not right. gonna worry about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, so um, do you do most of your composing these days um, behind the piano or with a guitar in your hand? I know you've done a little bit of both and you kind of transitioned at one point. How about today? I, I'm keeping it pretty 50-50. You know, I like to shake it up. If I'm, if I'm on a guitar, you know, you know, for too many songs in a row, you know, I'll, uh, I can't angle the camera, but I have a piano right there. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to say, I can see the little corner of the okay, you can. You, the yeah. only reason why I thought it was the piano, because I've seen some of your live streams and performances. I know you were part of a 24 hour quarantine concert. Yes, and, right. And I saw that grand piano. And I thought if I had a grand piano like that at my house, I'd be spending some time sitting back there recording, you know, and writing, you know, so, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, you know, some, some songs just, you know, kind of ask for one or the other. And some songs are just like, you know, I've been on this one for too long. I need to hop over there. So, right. yeah, I'm pretty 50, 50 these days. It's nice to have both. It's nice to, it's like yeah. you said at the time, I think I read something or heard something in one of your interviews where you said that, you know, there was a point where I felt like I was chasing some of the same things on the piano and the guitar yeah. was a new, you know, something for me that you had said, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely, you know, just kind of slip into the patterns and, and, uh, you know, you don't want to look back on your last eight songs and they all have the same little move in them. You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, when you write a song, do you think a lot about the length of the song or do people that are in the industry always remind you, well, Maya, you know, it shouldn't be longer than three point something minutes or right. does that ever happen? Or is it just kind of like you just let it go organically, naturally? You know, it used to happen. I think these days maybe, well, 
it might just be that I don't write that, you know, five and a half minute song anymore. It might be that, but it also could be that I, I think the industry doesn't, it doesn't seem to care as much about that. You know, there's so many ways to get your music out there and they're just not, you know, policed like they were, Yeah. you know, you know, for better or for worse. I guess if you wanted to, you know, if you're pitching to radio, it still kind of needs to be four ish or under four, but even that rule gets broken sometimes. Unless you're Don McLean or a queen, right? I mean, yeah. You know, then... <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there are still stations that'll just play a song because they love it. So I don't really have to think about that. But again, my, I don't go to those, like, let's vamp out for three minutes things anymore. Right. <laughs> so, right. Or even like solos. I don't even have that in the songs anymore. It's just like, I want to just the meat of the song and then I'm out, you know? <laughs> right. Right. Um, I want to talk about the new record. We got to talk about this. It's coming out this year, uh, May seven. May seventh. Okay, I I put down May. I wasn't positive that May seventh was the the date, but I had it here, and I know that I heard you saying sometimes I'm ready for it. It's coming soon, whenever mm -hmm. the right time is. So that's why I hesitated from saying the seventh. But yes, May seventh is the day. Yes, that's it. Um, Mercy Rising, Mercy Rising. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of putting that together? Um, well, that happened kind of, I really started to put that together when I first moved over to Nashville. Um, I had a few songs written already. And I, once I settled into this place, like April of 2019, I started to look at what I already had, what I maybe wanted to, uh, look further for maybe, you know, in the old stuff or some new songs that I wanted to write. I was going through pretty much it every change that can happen in, in your life. I mean, I had been in a relationship of 21 years that I was no longer in. So I, and I had lived in the state of California. Can you see it back there? Yes, <laughs> my, yes. my whole life. And, and now I didn't anymore. So I moved my, my home. I changed, you know, my personal life. I wasn't sure what my professional life was going to look like in this new city i had an idea that it it would be okay and you know i traveled a lot anyway so i knew i could actually do that more easily from here than i could you know from the west coast right but still it was just everything was different everything and that's reflected in in this album for sure like i'm the it it just wasn't it wasn't uh a comfortable feeling it wasn't easy um and i was i was hanging on to some i was hanging on to some stuff that just like wouldn't leave me alone or i wasn't figuring out how how to get it off yeah and and the title cut is is really about that so that i think i think i think that the title cut mercy rising is the first one where i sat down and i'm like i'm writing this new song for this album now this is what I need to say. And it was, it's kind of the most like all encompassing theme or the song that I think, you know, really hits the theme of, of the album and that I've done everything. I feel like I've done everything I know to do mm -hmm. to get just to move forward. Like, do I have to run more miles? Mm -hmm. Do I have to, have more wine? Do I have to have less wine? Do I have, you know, what do I have to do? Right, right. Do I have to like learn how to meditate? Like, what is it that I have to do? Do I have to write a letter and put it in the fire? Like, what is it? Mm -hmm. And um, so that, so that song's asking like, just show me any little change. Show me that, like make that star move. Just like something different. Show me a shift. I am sure that as you spend more time in Nashville and as we come out of the current uh, situ the health crisis that we're in, you know, I'm sure you'll see lots of stars moving and things happening that, you know, the signs in the universe that will help you to realize it's hard right now because it's such a unique time that you ended up moving down there. Who could have predicted that this would have happened, you know, but as this, as we start to get to, you know, step back into life again, I'm sure you'll see many signs that, you know, that the, the visuals and the things that are very, you know, reachable. Well, well, thank you for your optimism. I appreciate it. I'm the eternal optimist, Maya, the eternal optimist. You know, I feel that.
Yeah, you know, I am too. Like, there's always something else to try. I think that song was like, I'm running out of things to try, <laughs> you know? Right. But the song kind of ended up being the thing. It's like, that was what helped to move me forward is, is to write that thing and right. to, you know, record it and to go all the way with it. I, from the beginning of the writing process, I was like, I'm going to produce the living hell out of this song. Like, I'm going to get a string section. I'm going to just throw every, I want a wall of sound. I want yeah. this. I want to push this thing through my mind. And that also kind of helped, you know, to set the tone. Right, right. Very exciting, very exciting. So, you know, um, you've got, uh, I know you have another single, you have your first single, um, Whatever We Are, mm -hmm. has been out for a little bit now since maybe what, January? Well, it actually came out early. It came out in October of last year. I kind of sprung that one out early because um, I did a Facebook Live for a podcast called Song Writer. And I say it like that because it's one word, but the W is uppercase. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where they pair an author, a writer, with, with, a, with, with somebody who writes songs. And the, and the songwriter writes a song in response to the piece that the author has written. So Cheryl Strayed, who I love, um, read uh, a piece of hers and I wrote a song in response to it. But just because we were gonna do this thing together and it was gonna be out there in the world and I, and I realized that some of her fans are gonna you know, watch the podcast, um, I wanted to, I wanted to have a new song out there. So right. that, so that kind of lit a fire un, under me to start the whole, you know, you know, the whole single, you know, release path. Cause it's so hard to know like, okay, so when should I start? Especially last year, like I'm not gonna be able to tour around it. When should I, I you know, start to get these songs out? So the, you know, the songwriter podcast with Cheryl was like, okay, it's time. I got to, I got to get this rolling. And, but then the next single isn't coming out until, till Friday. Yeah. Tomorrow. Right. And so, and that, uh, <laughs> and that's when the world doesn't end. Right. Yeah. That's, and, and so I was kind of excited. I get to talk to you a day before the single, because I'm sure there's that anticipation of what are people going to, you know, gonna be out there and people are going to start commenting and everything. So I'm sure I there's that so. anticipation. Yeah. So, um, You've been so gracious as to agree to, to to sing a song for us today, and I thought this might be a good time to insert that here. We're talking about the new album, and um, is there a specific song that you had thought about for this morning that you feel fits the interview? Well, um, since we just talked about the first single, whatever we are, I thought maybe uh, you know maybe I would start there, and then you guys can hear the next single tomorrow. That's right. That's right. Can't believe I forgot it was tomorrow. I was. I'm still thinking it's Wednesday. It's so it crept up though. I touch I, in this in this current <laughs> world with with the weather and the pandemic. What day is it anymore? What day is it? You know what day? I know, especially with like just a blanket of snow out there for me uh, now. Yes. All right. So this is whatever we are. I'm gonna turn my camera off so people can focus on you. Okay. <laughs> Never again, but just not today. The first of our kind, or the oldest cliche. Right down the middle, or missed it by far. I love you, whatever we are. Kicking a habit or up in the doze. Two airplanes flying uncomfortably close. Leftover light from a long gone star. I love you. Ah! 
broken my heart Loving someone forever Whatever we are Stuck in the memories Trying to move on Changing the station singing along in the back of my mind or the back of your car I love you whatever we are and I'm not gonna stop when it puts up a fight I'll just learn how to see you in another new in my heart loving someone forever whatever we are you make me better oh you break my heart I love you forever whatever Just beautiful. Wow. I, I'm so honored that you would play today for our show. I'm just so oh, honored. Thank you. That was beautiful. Beautiful. It feels fun. Appreciate um, it. Um, so when you wrote that song and did you, was it hard to decide like what, that that's going to be your lead off single or did, how did, how does that come about for you? Like, so I, I wrote the first two verses of it um, on a long drive. I think I was coming back from a gig and this was uh 2019 so this was when you know those still happened <laughs> right <laughs> so i think it was like a six hour drive and i remember really just kind of needing to get this this feeling across of like i don't really feel this way yet about someone i'm uh, still carrying around a little bit of resentment but i this is how i want to feel this right. is like the more evolved me would say this <laughs> you know I love you, whatever we are. I know we've, we've been at all these things. Doesn't matter what it is. I just want to love you. So I had those two verses and um, I brought them back to Nashville and I had a writing session with two great writers, uh, actually my Roscoe and Roscoe and Ed, a duo partner, uh, 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 Anna Schulze, um, and a great, another fantastic song songwriter here uh, uh, named Thomas Fincham. And I just brought them the first two verses and like, okay, what do you guys, you know, what do you think of this? And we, we wrote it like it, I think it was just a couple out. In fact, it was in this, this very room. I think they were like each on one of those chairs. <laughs> so it was one of the first songs that I wrote here. Right. And, um, yeah, so so they were all over it and they just they you know, you know, they totally hopped on the train and we we brought that thing home and they preserved that feeling that I wanted to do of like, okay, what would that like Zen person say? The Zen person that I really want to be, you know. Right, right. That's so neat because it's it's I'm sure it's rewarding when you're writing on your own and you can come up with a certain path of your song but then also when you are inspired with other people in the room like that and and they make give you that missing oh, yeah. link that you know that extra in insight to your own life even they, from knowing you from knowing who you are and knowing what you're about to be able to put into words in a different way than you as the first person mm -hmm. do and then it kind of melds together yeah and you know you know there are 
you know, they're, they're also going to bring in their own experience too. So it's right. going to just, it's just going to be more and more layered, you know, and it also, it always shows, I don't know. I, I think this is a part of why I love to co-write so much. It always shows how many things we're, we're all experiencing that we think we, we think we're the only one, but you know, you know, you get in a room with somebody, you think that you're telling your story or you think that you're helping them tell their story and you realize that you completely resonate with it too. So I'm, I mean, I knew as soon as the three of us started writing it that like they were definitely relating to it in some way. Maybe it wasn't exactly the way I was, but you know, it definitely has all three of us. Well, I think we'd all be a little bit better off in life in a sense if we were willing to share all of our things because our, our stories and our trials and tribulations, because when we do say them out loud, we realize, yeah, you're feeling that too. And you're feeling that we, we do. You're right. You're right. It, you're so right. Yeah. It's helpful for the storyteller. It's helpful for the listener. Everybody wins. Yeah. When, when you share a hard, true thing. Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about Roscoe and, and Etta, you know, the guitars themselves, the guitars right. and That's, the musical group. So you did know about Roscoe and Etta. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. They're, they're two guitars. And, a, and also a duo. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So my last two releases have been have been with a duo. Um, we had one in 2018, no, 17 and then 18. Um, I, yeah, we, you know, that just started out as a, a writing session in Los Angeles. Anna and I met through, um, met through uh, a mutual friend uh, in, in LA after a show, actually, Garrison Starr. Oh. And I had, I, I had set, set in with Garrison on the guitar that turned out to be Etta. Okay. <laughs> and I remember Garrison introducing Anna and me and um, Anna was just like all about the guitar. You know, she was like, you know, staring at the guitar. This isn't her, but her, I mean, um, <laughs> but yeah, she was staring at the guitar and I'm like, um, I'm up here. <laughs> Hello. You know. <laughs> So we did just, it. we thought it was just going to be like, you know, let's just get together and write maybe something for Snake, maybe something for you, maybe something for me. And um, we, I think we were like one and a half songs in and we realized like, this is kind of its own animal. Like it's, it's not really you solo. It's not really me solo. Not sure who we would pitch it to. Maybe we need to think about like it being for us. Maybe it's just, you know aside you know a project thing yeah. and so um we did and we just kind of went all the way with it you know we've we really focused on writing the whole album and we did like a month or two worth of touring and we made our first vinyl <laughs> that was the first time that's great ever yeah had vinyl pressed first wow. time I ever had vinyl pressed Wow. Um, and now, of course, I'm I'm hooked. So there will yeah. be vinyl on the new record as well. Great. Um, but yeah, we just, you know, it just it just found its its own voice. And, you know, kind of like we were saying earlier, we just had to follow it. You know, it wasn't what we planned, but it was so obviously what it had to be. If we wanted these songs to be out there the way that we wanted them to be out there, we were going to have to do it. So it's on now, you know. That's so exciting. I mean, you, you, and just being open to whatever may be. You, you just said, hey, well, let's try this. Let's do it this way. Let's do it for us yeah. instead of for, you know, you just being open to things. You never know what's what's next. Yeah, as long as it feels, you know, authentic to yourself and, and you're still, you know, you're excited about it, you know, you know, and you're passionate about it. It's all those things that we said earlier. Like if you if you really love it and you really love the doing of it and that's more important than whatever comes back. Right. Then usually more does actually show up for you because you're because you're you know you're putting it out there in a real way. So true. So true. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your your partnership with P Patreon. Is it pronounced Patreon? Oh, yeah. Uh, Patreon, I think. Patreon. I'm not sure. Think, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they care. Okay. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> And, and yeah. I know that you just started working on with that not too long ago, I believe, just getting into that world. I just started hearing about them just a few weeks ago. And then, so it's funny, like if you're looking oh, for perfect. a house, you see real estate ads. If you're looking for a car, you see car ads. I heard about them two weeks ago and then I'm talking to you and you're actually one of the members that are working with them. So it's kind of neat. 
Yeah, I'm I'm convinced that those those things that happen like right when you're talking about it aren't really a coincidence. Like I agree. Phone, I completely agree. Yeah. About it. yeah. 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 <laughs> um yeah, it was kind of right at the beginning of the of the lockdown. So, um I, and I, I yeah, I I wanted a way to, you know, to to stay connected with people that wanted to hear the music. I wanted something to kind of keep a fire lit under me to keep on putting out some new stuff. So yeah, Patreon is a, um, it's a really cool subscription platform where you can find many artists like of all kinds, like music, painting, I think there's all kinds of things there. And for whatever price you choose to pay per month, you get a certain level of things like, you know, the lowest tier for me gets a brand new unreleased song uh, uh, once a month and like a weekly video check in. And, you know, I just kind of talk about, you know, you know, whatever's going on every now and then I throw in a song like live in the check in. If you sign up for the next one after that, you get like an online stream show. Uh, after that, you get two handwritten lyrics. Then you get a workshop after that. And then you get a custom song after that. And, and, and every artist like, you know, you know, sets their own levels and what they want to offer. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's been, I feel like it's been a very mutual thing because the people that have signed up seem to you know, really like hearing the new stuff and really like that we, you know, we kind of have a dialogue now. Yeah. And I have like, it makes me, it isn't like I have to be forced, but it's nice to know that there's people that want to hear a new song. Yeah. And as long as there's people that I know specifically even who they are that are, might be waiting or might be looking forward to hearing a new song, that's going to light a fire under me to get, get that new song finished, you know? Right. So I think it's it's just been very helpful all the way around. It sounds like a really neat platform. I was reading about the different levels of what you offer for your for your for the membership for your your music, and it's really it is really neat. And I think that uh, the article that I had read about a couple of weeks ago said they feel like it's a new platform that would really um, people worry so much about how, number of views and everything with all these different things to get to a certain place. And this is something completely different that really could take off. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the thing I really love about it is that it's entirely personal. Like I, I know, I know who my people are. It feels like I'm playing a little club every time, which is my favorite thing anyway. It's like, I can, I can picture the faces. Like I, you know, I know who's out there. It's not just like somebody likes a post, but didn't listen to the song. Like I know that they listened, you know, I know. And I know that they wanted it. And another thing I, that I, I might add that the, the album comes out on, May 7th, but uh, I've made it, I've already made it available to everybody who has signed up for the Patreon page. So they get an early, an early peek at just about like everything that I do. So they're going to get the album first. They're going to get the vinyl first. They get a discount on everything, you know. So it's really neat for the, for the fan of, you know, of, of a, of a career like yours, you know, to be able to just dial in like that to, to get that up close and personal, um, you know, interaction with, with you as a, as a singer songwriter. And then also in addition to the new album, a song a month, something, I'm going to play this song for you. I'm going to sing this song for you. How neat is that? That's just, it's just really a neat thing. Yeah. So exciting. Um, you've been so gracious with your time today. So I just really want to, you know, thank you and just ask you if there's besides Patreon, of course, um, what are the, are the best ways for people to find you on social media? What are the places that you find yourself, you know, sauntering through a lot? Uh, well, I do have a, a, finally have a shaped up website, um, which you can find at mayasharp.com, M-A-I-A, sharp like the cheese. <laughs> um, Instagram is Maya Sharp Music. Uh, Twitter and Facebook are Maya Sharp. Uh, there's two Facebooks. There's a Maya Sharp official too, but uh, I post pretty much the same thing on, you know, on the other Facebook too. So right. uh, yeah, those are all, I think those are all my socials. Well, I know there'll be a, a, a good number of people who are going to be so excited to hear, you know, our talk and, and it's going to inspire them. Hopefully the great things that, you know, you've, you've 
shared with us today about your career that will make them curious to go out if they haven't already, which there's a good chance that they already have because you've been out there doing so many things for so many artists uh, and for your own career, um, your own music, that uh, if they don't already know, they're going to be excited to, after, especially after hearing you sing today, to, to go and check this out, to check out this wonderful career that you have. Wonderful. Well, I, I definitely hope so. Thank you so much for this. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I thank you for your time. And uh, I wish you the best of luck as we all, and success. It's not about luck. It's just not luck. It's success and it's, it's good Work. strategic moves and just That's a good right. feeling. You know, it's not luck. I, I, I find myself a lot of times of, uh, I, I teach musical theater, you know, that's one of the things I do. And I find myself saying to my students, good luck. And then I stop myself and I say, it's not about luck. It's about skill and talent. It's not about luck. And I stop myself. Now I usually can stop myself before I say good luck. I just say, do well, is what I say. I say, do well. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's such a cliche. It's been there for so long, but yes, right. it does it. Yeah. You can't just kind of wait around for, you know, for something to happen. It's definitely, right. definitely work. Well, Maya, again, I thank you so much for your time today. And we're looking forward to hearing your new album on May 7th, Mercy Rising. Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to so many great songs for you in the future. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to.